Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Living in the Limelight, an Anton Scholl and Friends podcast where we discuss music from the artist and fan perspective. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Well, I will say this, and, and I know, I'm sure a lot of other people feel this way, but to me, you know, uh, Eric, probably one of the most underrated singers I've ever heard. The voice, powerful, phenomenal. You you found him off of a demo, I believe, that you heard way back in the day. How did you, what, what was that first listen when you heard that? Mike Varney, famous for finding... Uh... For, he had spotlight on new talent, a guitar player, man. He put three, three new guys in there every month. And it was before the internet. So everybody was all excited to get the new magazine. Who's the new guys are kind enough to put me in there. He put Paul Gilbert in there. He put Ingve in there. I think Tony McAlpine, a lot of great players started in Mike Varney's column. So I would talk with Mike on the phone all the time. He is a hilarious, one of my most favorite human beings in the world. And we would, I lived in an apartment in LA at the time and the people upstairs would be three in the morning, shut up down there. I'm like, wow, I'm laughing on the phone to Mike yeah. Barney. He's just so great. And uh, uh, so we were, we were I, I talked with Paul Gilbert and uh, I had Pat Torpy on hand too. I get, God, we got to get a singer. We got to get a singer. And so uh, I looked around at a couple of people, nothing really floated my boat. And then Mike Barney goes, well, I got this guy up in, in uh, up here in San Francisco. His name's Eric Martin. I never heard of him before. So he goes, let me play you something. He played me something. I go, that's what I'm yeah. talking about. Steve wow. Marriott means Paul, uh, Paul uh, uh, from uh, Bad Company. Uh, Paul Rogers. Paul Rogers, yeah. Uh, soulful. Right. But when he, he sings rock, it's a new, like, like Paul Rogers, mm -hmm. soulful rock singer with a voice like that. And uh, that was that. But it came with a bonus. And the bonus was Eric was associated with Herbie Herbert, was one of the most powerful managers in the biz and yeah. one of the founding fathers of the music business as we know it he put journey together you know he that was his mm -hmm. baby right uh and uh so he got involved which is probably one of the greatest things that ever happened to my life and career and he wow. managed to get us our deals and our tours and the best uh the best deals you could imagine with the labels and uh mm. was a huge uh, asset to us and an amazing wonderful man passed away a few years ago, sadly, but so yeah. that was how Eric came in. And then I heard him, then I was driving over the hill over Coldwater Canyon to my home in the Valley. And they played, I can't stop the fire, which was from some soundtrack. And Eric mm -hmm. sang on it. I think Neil Sean played on it with him or something. Oh, and, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, wow, who is this guy? This guy. <laughs> and I, I, I remember later on, I talked with uh, my friend. Oh, that's, yeah, that's Eric. So I, that, that, that that's him for sure so that's the one so we got together and we got together and uh with paul and pat our first time and i think the first song we wrote was anything for you off the very first record and then we took it from there oh it's a great lineup great lineup and yeah, I'm now very i gotta lucky. go I'm, very, yeah. I'm very lucky to uh have uh, found those guys and they trusted mm -hmm. me enough to join with me I just yep. come out of the raw thing and two platinum records and I was in good shape and uh, ready to start my, my own thing. But I didn't want to be like the leader necessarily. I wanted everybody to have a part in, in decision-making and have it be a more diplomatic uh, situation. Yep. It, it worked out very well. And Sorry. I, you have no, no. I, I want to say this. I want to go to the fan question. So I'm going to look and I'm going to see which ones uh, we're going to go through, but I do want to mention, uh, you were talking about covers and stuff before uh, I saw you in Chicago and I don't remember the year it was, it was, it was in the nineties. I saw you in Chicago play and you know, I already knew you were just an outstanding bass player, but then you had to go in and play Baba O'Reilly three piece <laughs> tore me up. I just, I couldn't believe you guys were doing that. I mean, obviously, you know, the whole thing with the, uh, with the drills and the playing and all the different things that you do and how you play amazing 
But to to pull off a song like that, I mean, that would have been me saying, "No, we can't do it. We don't have a synthesizer. We don't have any 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 backing tracks." I mean, how difficult or was that kind of a challenge for you guys to do? And that's why you chose it. I was a, such a Who fan. I that music was in my blood. Uh, the old version of Talos, we did a. The live at Leeds, my generation medley that goes into uh, oh. "See Me, Feel Me," and then sure. into uh, some uh, into uh, I forgot the last song, but there's three songs, and that and whistle bass and his tone yeah. was very very huge influence on me. So I felt at home playing anything by the Who. I, I remember when uh, the Who's mm-hmm. Next came out, I put that record on, even though I was in a band and playing every night. I put that record on every day, just play along to it. Flip it over, play along with it, flip it over. That's it. Just keep going all yeah. day on that. And I learned those songs like you know they were part of my DNA. Mm-hmm. Really, really uh, uh, into that band. I saw them also with Keith Moon. Uh, I think in early seventies. I forgot which year, but they played in Buffalo with the first laser light show I ever saw. And we were right up front with Daltrey swinging the mic, and uh, it was wow. Amazing. So, so there was so much love, <laughs> if you will and admiration for them and and i spent so much time playing though i didn't i i maybe i should have been a a, a little bit more uh uh, uh tentative but I, <laughs> I just that's that song bob o'reilly is so much you know yeah. i just thought i can do the piano parts right and then, okay you got a violin so like well i could you know kind of do something here <laughs> And yeah, right. Paul, Paul was brilliant, and he could do all those stuff that you could do. It's amazing, yeah. and he's got to play that thing through the whole thing. So it's amazing, right. uh, it's just uh, uh, endurance on his part. Yeah. Uh, so, and of course, Eric sang it amazingly, and Pat's right. drums was spectacular. So, yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, we didn't look at it as daunting because I think we we all had such. We just love that band and those songs so much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get to the uh, fan questions here. Um, Okay. So I got one from uh, obviously a lot of, uh, a lot of kudos and a lot of uh, mentionings of you being the best and all of that, of course. Um, So I got one here from, uh, from Pete Wright. And he says, after chasing the perfect bass tone for your entire life, what was the biggest folly? What was like the issue that you had? Uh, did you have any issue where you just couldn't find the sound? I guess they say. Well, I had a lot of failures in gear. I had a custom preamp made, and this thing sang like uh, just just the most beautiful harmonic content. You'd hold a note, and you'd hear three harmonics uh, in key in each note. It was just so great. And it was made from an Ashley audio input module, one of the mixing consoles, which had volume and tone controls mm, yeah. and uh, put in a rack and a few things added to it and subtracted to it. And this thing was just amazing. Then it failed. And it turns out mm. that the chip maker Raytheon sent out a letter to their people who build products out of their integrated circuit chips that the, a bad batch went out and they apologized. So the reason oh. why it sounded so amazing is there was some <laughs> anomaly to that chip. Wow. And so I spent years trying to get back to that sound again. And I was miserable and oh, oh it was so tough. And I just was, you know, was just pining for the days when I could just hold that note and uh, it, was, it was just so great. So finally hmm. I came up with a kind of a workaround for a few years with a Furman preamp, which used the same chips, uh, different manufacturer though got pretty close to it. And then a guy in Buffalo named Dan Pierce made the Pierce preamp and it was really close. And I said, man, if you could just put one more gain stage in the front end, so I could hit it a little harder. And he did. And that thing was, I've used that wow. where I'm sitting now. It's four feet in front of me uh, in the rack still to this day, the first yeah. one I got from him. And it's still uh, just an amazing sounding thing. And in my helix, which I use live, they took that actual preamp and modeled that in the Helix software. So when you buy the Helix, you get you get my original Pierce oh. preamp built, built into it. Wow. So, so, but for a couple of years, man, man, I and I had about ten custom preamps built by all these guys who said they had it figured out. Mm-hmm. Nothing worked. 
and uh, I like, blew through all all. I didn't even own a car until like uh, years later because I spent all my money trying to track down this holy grail of of wow. don't. And uh, so that was that was a tough period. But then uh, after that, uh, it was a, a pretty simple thing. The tone is a mixture of clean and distorted from one pickup out of one output and then just super deep low end from another pickup into a separate amp. Because if you try to get low end and distort it, it just turns into mush. So I've got yeah. these defined notes in the low end, defined notes from a clean signal mixed mm -hmm. in with the distortion. So my little EBS pedal, I don't see, I thought I had one sitting around here, kind of does that same thing in a miniature version. EBS makes a signature pedal. Mm -hmm. So you can dial in how much distortion you want, but the clean yeah. never goes away. And I remember when the first uh, first time I heard uh, Dance to the Music, uh, that's uh, uh, Larry Larry Graham on bass, right? I don't know. I'm slightly slight famous. Uh, yeah. Anyway, when it, when it, uh, I'm going to add some bottom of the dance. And he goes, uh, there's no low end at all. It's just, because yeah. you lose all the low end when you distort. So I, I love that song and that's the coolest thing ever. And he is one of the he's he's the guy who invented uh slap as far as I know. He's the mm -hmm. first guy to do it. Uh but uh but I, I I wanted that, but I needed a low end too. So that kind of how it all came together. So there's a lot more involved in it than uh just turning some knobs. You uh, yeah, <laughs> it was a real quest for you. I had to get kind of an audio engineering uh, fake education <laughs> as yeah. I went. Because we had oscilloscope set up to look at the waveform of the uh, original preamp, and it did a perfect little dip and all rounded off, no square, harsh anything. Oh, because then that goes. <laughs> but it was a smooth, yeah. beautiful uh, soprano sax singing. Uh, it was amazing. And a after that, we could never get anything that wasn't square or sharp, mm. edgy, and harsh and awful. And we tried everything. I went through dozens of preamps with uh, all kinds of people. And finally it got resolved at great expense on my part. Right. <laughs> all right. I have something here that's kind of, I, I have never heard this before. It may be a rumor uh, listed as a rumor. And now you'd have to tell me if it's true. But so Brian Wheeler is asking the question that you were chosen by Chris Squire as a successor for yes but never happened because the other people in the group had an issue. Was there ever anything to you being involved with? Yes. Utter, complete and total balderdash. Not, ah, a, okay. not a shred of truth in that. <laughs> not never happened. Nothing. I knew Chris, uh, a yeah. wonderful guy. I saw him out at the rainbow off. And one night it was me, John Entwistle and Chris Squire. And then Lemmy came and sat with us. Oh, we had a man. photo of it. They put it up and somebody stole the photo. But oh. I, I have the photo before Lemmy got there of me, John Atwistle, and Chris Squire. We had a riot. We had a great time. So I love those guys. And they're old wow. Englishmen, you know, and they'd uh, be having their drinks and telling me stories sure. and all that stuff. But never, ever, ever. It's amazing how many stories I hear that are yeah. just come, <laughs> somebody sat around in their bedroom and made it up. So well, we'll make sure we put that one to rest. <laughs> um, and I've never heard that before, ever, either. Yeah. Never heard Well, that you know. Like you said, there could be just some keyboard warriors that are just, you know, going on and saying, well, hey, ask him this. Um, there was somebody had asked me a question. I'm trying to find it on here because I thought this was interesting. And again, don't know if it's true or not, but it has to do with a Yamaha uh, promo that you had done. And it is from Rachel and Carlos Salinas. And um, I'm trying to find it because it was something about uh a, a a promo that you did oh here it is back in the day there was a yamaha promotional poster of billy with a double neck base that had a harp attachment between the necks do you does billy remember that base does he still have the base and was it a functional harp or just a gimmick gimmick it was it a gimmick. Wasn't very functional they had between the two bridges they just put a little piece of angled aluminum and ran mm. strings and then made a little bridge from one headstock to the other and put <laughs> the uh, strings in there. 
ah. uh, as as comedy. But as we know now, yeah. sometimes people get really misled by that stuff, and I feel bad about it because I think it's an actual thing. I took it <laughs> right. off, and uh, eventually, uh, and, and just abandoned it. But I still have that double neck. Matter of fact, I just had it refurbished. Got oh, all you the, do have it. the new DiMarzio pickups on it. And I was just playing it the other night, and it plays great, really nice. Oh, it was. It was remember I earlier mentioned the RBX basses was a Japanese uh, domestic bass. It was basically a double neck RBX, but it's still beefy mm -hmm. and plays great. And the necks are big and fat on it. it wow, it's quite nice. I've got that. I got the double neck that we've seen recently that I talked about earlier, and now there's a double neck Yamaha bass and guitar, and the guitar mm -hmm. has the Evertune bridge on it which is a freakishly amazing device where the guitar does not go out of tune and really? every note on the neck is perfectly in tune all the time. The first time I tried it, I thought it was some kind of a prank because I couldn't <laughs> believe it, but it, it is unbelievable. Uh, and so I did a double neck with the Everton bridge because I know one of them will always be in tune. In case, in case the bass goes out, I can just play a note on the guitar and tune to that. Uh, so I don't have to worry about it. So I'm, I'm, and that would always seem to be a thing that 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 I questioned all the time is how do your bases stay in tune? Because you you beat that thing silly. Yeah. You know how how do they stay in tune like that? Is it because you, of that? If you properly put the strings on and stretch them, I go through a whole night and don't tune. I don't tune for the whole show, wow. and I'm in. So you take like for example this bass. I don't know if I did it on this one, so it might be a good example. So if I just take the G string, I got a little distorted tone here because I was doing some goofy stuff earlier. This isn't a normal bass, I'll say. There's the G. So if I pull on it, stretch it. So it's a little flat. So pull on it again. You pull from the uh, tuning peg. Bass, bass never goes out of tune at the bridge. It only goes out of tune at the tuning peg. So you got to make sure you okay. wind those things around there so there isn't they aren't wrapped around each other. So when you yeah. pull on it, I think it'll work better on the E string. So it did go a little flat. But on the E string, if I pull on that, it's down a whole step. So I'll pull yeah. on it again as hard as I can. That one's not going to break. Still flat. Pull it up. Wow. Barely flat. Now you right. can go probably all night on that and it won't go flat. Huh. Wow. Go Sometimes a little heat will move things, the lights, but most uh, stage lights now are LED and they're not quite as hot as they used to be. So that isn't so much a factor anymore. So, uh, yeah, if you, I, I, and yeah. I, I got to do a, a video about that, my little homespun YouTube. I started a little YouTube channel, did a couple of videos. Then the pandemic ended and I had to go on tour. So people oh. think I abandoned, but I'll, I'll be back with more. And uh, yeah. I'll do one about how to really properly do that and get the windings right on the on the post and mm -hmm. make sure that the nut is uh, cut right and maybe even lubricated if you have to. But I can go a whole night without, to, and I hit it hard. Uh, and a lot of string bends that a lot of think people think yeah. it's uh right that's a three fret or uh, at the high note it can tune up to a g yeah. uh, uh and that's wow. just and it's not uh, and people uh think it's it's a it's a fake uh that i'm that the strings are either super light or i'm tuned down uh, th these are standard, my standard rotosound. The G is a 43 instead of a 45, but that's just smaller winding. The core string is mm -hmm. is the same size. Mm -hmm. I did it so that the string yep. would be a, a, a little bit, uh, there, there's, well, there's a couple of reasons I won't get to go yep. into. Nevertheless, uh, if you get all your fingers behind there, and that's what I've been, I got all three fingers there. And they're all three, all three are pushing. Wow. You're getting up there, yeah. So, so it's not a – I posted a, a photo of me bending the strings, and most of the people in the comments understood what was going on, but other people, there's no yeah. way. He couldn't do that. <laughs> Shit, right. Liar, we hate you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, and, and I, oh, I'll tell you this. 
bass players obviously don't listen to me, but maybe they'll listen to you. Please tell bass players not to boil their strings and reuse them. What? Un un what? <laughs> Unless it's something that you do. Oh, I did it one day. Right. Because I, I couldn't afford a new set of strings. Yeah. So I took uh, I took the old set off, put them in a little saucepan with water. I put it, my secret was I put a, two drops of dishwashing detergent because that broke up the oil. And the only problem is they break easier. Because I've right. never legitimately broken a string, uh, a boiled string, because you put them on, it's, it's at that angle, and you put it on again and it turns it around. So it gets a weak mm -hmm. spot where you bend, you know, you can break metal sometimes by bending it back and forth. So I've had yeah. had them break after boiling. But when I was broke and in uh in a in a uh, early days of Talus, I would I'd boil them all and they, you they did. Come back almost brand new sounding. So wow. it was great. Or wow. another thing you okay. do is uh get uh aftershave, uh like old spice, or just rubbing alcohol. I use old spice because my bases used to be put away wet. And so when you take mm -hmm. it out the next day that wetness fermented and it wasn't very pleasant. <laughs> so, I, so I'd use Old Spice or Aqua Velva. And I remember reading about it from Stanley Clark doing that. He just put some, <clears throat> pardon me, put some on a towel, rub it up and down the string and then they come right back. Rubbing alcohol will do it or wow. Old Spice smells better. But wow, yeah, all those tricks. Sure. Okay, well then there you go. Bass players, <laughs> it's okay. Another Boil their strings. Another uh, <laughs> rumor squash. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have somebody. Uh, so Chris Lebon wants to know: Do you have any advice on for him becoming a session bassist? Well, there's not so many sessions anymore. It's yeah. just not really. A, there used to be a scene in LA where there were studios all over the city, and uh, session players would drive from one session to another, to another, to another. Those days are long gone. Yeah. There's, no, Very there's only a couple studios left, big studios left in LA, because everybody in my house here now, I've got everything I need to do a whole record other than a drum room. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I have guys that do have that. But to be a session player, there's just not much call for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, because uh, with the internet now, uh, you can, a lot of players will do sessions for anybody. I never advertised or said anything, but when the pandemic started, I started getting requests. Can you play bass on a track? And then, well, I'm sure. And they send me the track, and we'd work out, you know, what mm. what, what it was worth to them, and yeah. they compensate me for it, and uh, try to give everybody a good deal because it was pandemic time. Uh, but we we did four or five hundred tracks during the during the pandemic, myself mm. and my engineer, and uh, all kinds of music from all all over the world. Some of it pretty rough, some of it amazing. <laughs> Uh, yeah. so, uh, but being a session player straight up, I, I don't think it, at least mm -hmm. Clark is probably one of the most called upon rock and pop session players. Yeah. And, uh, so there's him, but I can see, you know, a, a big artist, well, we'll call Lee Sklar or well, let's call this guy. We don't know. It's just, it's, it's, yeah. tough. how can you get known by doing more <laughs> sessions? We, there's no sessions to do. So, uh, give it a try, but uh, the only places you could really do it is Nashville or L.A., maybe yeah. New York, maybe. <laughs> but I know in Nashville, there's a couple of guys that do everything that they call on, that they rely yeah. on. There's one drummer here that plays on everybody's record, kind of like the Hal Blaine mm. of country music. I forgot the gentleman's name. Mm. But, uh, uh, so there's, there's guys in those areas that, 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 that kind of own it, and they don't necessarily want to give it up to some some outsider. <laughs> Oh, sure. Right. Take all my gigs. Go ahead. You know, so uh, it, I would advise, you know, uh, my, my, my rule, my three rules that I think when you run the numbers have resulted in more careers and success and fame than anything. Get in a band. Get in a band with songs. Get in a band with songs that you sing. One, mm -hmm. two, three. Beatles yep. and Allen, ACDC, right. most successful bands ever were started a band. Getting a band does a lot of things. You learn to work with other people. You learn to play as an ensemble player instead of soloing into a camera for, for the internet. <laughs> right. You got to play with the drummer. Or you got to make room for the singer. Get out of the way of the guitarist as a bass player. Uh, lock in right. with that bass drum. You got to learn how to play in 
a group of people and make it where you got to get along with people. You got to learn a little bit about the business because you're going to have yeah. to collect money at the end of the night and pay crew guys or whatever else you do. You learn so much about things that are so important to you later. Get in a band with songs. You need songs. You got to have songs. Songs drive everything. The song is everything. Right. Without to be with you, Mr. Big, I don't know. I've, you may have never heard of us, you know, or mm. songs like that, or Just Take My Heart, or Green Tinted, or uh, yeah, uh, Nothing But Love, and song, songs we've had through the years. Uh, songs are, are drive everything. Uh, songs that you sing sure. on uh, America's Got Talent. I mean, they got all kinds of things on there now, but originally it was just singers. You don't see bass players going up there or drummers. <laughs> right? See singers. It's about singing. It's about songs and singing. Sure. Uh, get a guitar. You know a whole bunch of Beatles songs and sit around and play with your friends. It's a riot because there's right. songs. You need songs. So those three things. So being a session player is a is a you know it's a fine goal, and I, I don't mean to pour cold water on it, but there's not much of a scene for session players anymore of any any right. kind of instrument. And a lot of guys just do the bass on MIDI and, and fake it. A lot of the bass True. on yeah. all the almost all the top 40 now, there's no real bass or rarely right. real bass or right. real drums. Mm -hmm. uh, on any yeah. of it. It's mostly program. So sad, but but we still have right. a great, vibrant, money making, uh uh satisfying scene as a rock band. We, mm -hmm. we play all over the place. The rock scene in South America is amazing. Southeast Asia, Australia, Japan, uh, Europe is incredible. Russia, you know, I, I, we've played in India, all over the pl place. It's a vibrant, live music is great, and it's still yeah. a great thing uh, for people. Oh, so yeah. don't, don't, don't let me discourage you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, just <clears throat> encourage you to maybe look elsewhere for uh, career satisfaction. Yeah. Okay. All right. I got two more questions for you because I know if we, if I answer all these questions, we're going to be here all night and I don't want to take up that much of your time. But, time. I'm, I'm uh, cool. Uh, Anton, whatever. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> as, so as Jack, as, as much as your listeners and watchers will endure. I'll, I'll, I'm happy. To oh no, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, Jackie A wants more niacin. Yeah. I love so what that. is going on with that. Well, uh, we just been busy. I've been busy with so many other things, having a chance, but and niacin is the drummer, Dennis Chambers. And Dennis, I often say, is the greatest musician I know on any instrument. <laughs> He's, mm -hmm. He has just changed my life in so many positive, wonderful ways. And a B3 player named John DeVello, great, awesome B3. Uh, but Dennis was, uh, my whole life was straight up, mostly two, four rock drummers. Once in a while, we do some odd time thing or whatever. Not that Dennis is like some odd time wizard, but he can play anything. But he's just his timing is just so righteous and so smooth, and uh, he's always on. Even when he purposely goes off, he's still on, and he'll come right back on one. Even even though he left the building and ran around the block, he'll come back and land on it. And it was mm. just such great education for me uh, to play with uh, someone of his, his supreme talent. Uh, oh. But yeah, thank you for mentioning uh, Nias and we. Uh, I should put out, we should re-release -re all our stuff again or maybe, maybe remastered and whatever. And maybe I'll let it give it a, sure. little, a little impetus to do some shows again. I'd love to. Yeah. Well, you know, um, <coughs> obviously there's, I mean, there's questions on winery dogs, but I know um, it, just people asking about, you know, what, what's happening and uh, you know, you're, what, what's going on with, with winery dogs and is there going to be anything else coming out? Well, uh, about the last month of our shows we did in the last tour, uh, Mike said he had something he wanted to tell us. And he goes, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to Dream Theater. And me and Richard, oh, fucking great, man. Good for you. Yeah. You know, and, and we're, we're very happy for him. Uh, and uh, the, the, at that time, and since then, I haven't heard anything different. The idea was to go because he hasn't quit any of his other bands uh, right. that he plays with. And so he's just going to do his dream theater thing. And he's done with that. We'll hopefully do some more wine reducts. I haven't heard right. anything to the contrary. So, huh. so that's cool. Okay. And I, I, I wish him well. Yeah. Because I, I, uh, I, I know uh, that means a lot to him to get back with that band and you know, good for him. Yeah. yeah. All right. And then we have one from, uh, 
Uh, well, Richard Stevens wants to know what's, what's your practice routine because <laughs> you really do a lot on stage. You're very physical. You're running around. I mean, you would even mention your age and that doesn't seem to matter at all. Um, you know, and, and so what is that practice routine? How do you get in shape to play that way, especially with, you know, your right and left hand, the way that you're playing, especially with your right hand, all, you know, all your fingers con consistently hitting the strings. Um, you know, it, what is that routine? It is elaborate, grueling, ever changing. And uh, I spent a lot of time on it. Uh, mm. I will purposely come up with picking patterns that defy my my actual capabilities and work on them and work on them and work on them and work on them. And then you see a little incremental increase mm. and then it, uh, and until finally it starts to get up to a point where you can actually do it, not use it on stage live. And then mm -hmm. you can continue mm -hmm. on. I've got uh, a lot of times I do a, a lot of drum rudiments, string to string, because, you know, uh, uh, a paradiddle is, uh, is, you know, uh, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Uh, it's backwards on the screen. Yeah. So I'll do a lot of. Uh, ah. Double strokes. Or. Uh, I do a thing I call the Ed Sheeran because it sounds like one of his songs. <laughs> and then, then reverse it with a lower string D in the second. Hmm. It's all these things that, that force my fingers to right. do really difficult patterns. And I also want to be able to play consistent, those straight forever. They have them be rock solid in time. And so I'll do a lot of practice between uh, just like four notes, uh, four times each note. I see I blew it the first time. Wow. Yeah. See, one of them was three. What's it for? But I got it that time. Uh, mm. And sit there yeah. for hours. And, just, and then reverse it and make the the two notes on the lower string and all this forces my hand to do the uh, just a, insane stuff. So when it's time to play, yeah. I kind of build a machine out of my hands and now I don't have to worry about, can I hit those notes? I can relax and just do music and not worry about mm. you know yeah. any, any limitations of what my hands do. So I try to put my hands through an elaborate uh, obstacle course of uh movements wow. and left hand too same thing all these patterns and all these different things that i do yeah. and do it for hours and do it hard and heavy do it in time do it to a metronome sometimes uh some people get controversy over the metronome i put it on and, and, and play to it i notice if i'm playing away playing away okay everything's fine put the metronome on do the same thing it's harder so it indicates to me that i'm i'm catching up to the time or, or, or fixing time because I'm not in time. Yeah. So if I, if I was in time, it would probably feel exactly the same. But it's a little harder. So mm -hmm. I go, okay, so if I'm not in time, let's just set that metronome and go for a couple of hours until you land on it. And I got this wow. great app. It's a beat detector app. You can put it on and you can just keep, and it keeps the line. Is it, are you in time or not? And when you go out, it, 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 it changes. So you try to keep that line. Oh. Just, just try. Yeah. Don't even play. Just clap to it. Can you stay in time? And it's, it's mm. tough. It's tough. But enough work on it, and it comes around, and you can improve on that stuff yeah. and change it. So, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that, and this is true for everyone. If you work at it hard enough, you can probably get it. Now I always tell players they're kind enough to maybe say something, uh, uh, compliment me. I said, "There's nothing I do that you can't do." And I, I believe that yeah. I, there's nothing I do that you can't do. It may take you a lot of time. I mean, I've been playing right. for 50, for over half a century. <laughs> sure. Amazing. So, so it may take <laughs> you some time, but you can do it. It's, it's, it's not right. It's, it's not a difficult thing. Like that's that bending thing I just showed. Anybody can do it if you get, if you do it right. Yeah. But it's, it, it's not a trick or, a, or, or anything, but it takes a little work to, to get the, your hands in that position to get those bends and stuff like that, but anybody can do it. 
So it's kind of the, somebody had once said, practice, don't practice until you get it right. Practice until you can't get it wrong. That's a good, that's, that's a good saying. That's kind of like what, uh, what, what you're doing there. I, uh, I, I had a last question on here and I lost. Oh, okay. So Jimmy McCauley, he wants to know if there was a super group that you can put together now, because you played with so many people and so many amazing musicians. If there was a super group that you can put together right now, what would it be? Who would it be? Oh, that's a tough one. There's so many. Well, a lot of the problems with super group is you get the greatest guitar player and the greatest drummer and the greatest bass player. And the most amazing singer. And it's a mess because right. you, there has to be a little bit of a, not inequality, but a, some kind of differential. Oh, different styles. Yeah. You can't put those people together. Guitarist, it's really simple, but it's this amazing chording thing, but it's not a high right. speed guy. And a bass player that's, uh, you know, maybe plays a stand up bass, something different. Right. And a drummer that's like plays on a cocktail kit. And this unbelievable singer, you know, so there's all kinds of ways to go about it. But I, I think a lot of time, the super group uh, moniker, it, it gets tossed around. When we put the winery dogs together. We weren't thinking super group. We just, hey, Mike plays drums. You play guitar and sing. Right. I play bass. Let's let's go. It wasn't like yeah. trying to be some big thing. And, you know, yeah. Uh, so I, I I don't know. I, I would I'm not sure who I would pick. There's a lot of this incredible talent out there now. Yeah. And uh I know in my early days, I did not hold back much at all. I went I went for it all the time. And then as I got more sensible and older, I began to balance things. And sometimes that happens with, with age. Sometimes it never happens. Sometimes it doesn't have to happen because you already have it. Uh, so it's hard to say uh, uh, what I would consider a super group at this time. I would probably consider it non-traditional instruments. Like I, I mm. uh, gu guitars are everywhere all the time. Right. So I'm a big fan of a lot of sax players and piano players. And uh, I love classical music, uh, string mm. sections and cellos and all that. So yeah, be, that's a tough one for me to answer. I might have to take a zero on that for, for <laughs> total utter failure. Right. And come up with it. In the past, you know, I love Paco de Lucia, a flamenco guitarist, mind blowing. Yeah. But for every mind blowing, amazing, incredible guy, there's there's 20 or 30 other on the internet that are incredible also. Yeah. If they haven't had the kind of success. Uh, and that's again why I said those, right. those three rules get in the band, get in the band with songs, get in the songs, band with songs that you sing is a little bit more safe way to, to get somewhere than to just videotape yourself being amazing alone in yeah. a room. Uh, Though I'm an old man, so it might be an old, stupid, passe <laughs> idea. And and that really no. is the way to get it now. And I should just go away sure. quietly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, not at all. We don't want that. We don't want that. Um, all right. I got to tell you, this was uh, such a great time. You know, people always say, you know, don't meet your heroes. You'll be disappointed. I certainly was not disappointed by this, Billy. And I really appreciate you doing this for me. Uh, Very kind a lot of say it. Thank a lot you. of bass players out there uh, who really look up to you and watch what you play and really learn from you. And, you know, as musicians, we all certainly do appreciate that. So uh, I, I appreciate you doing this podcast with me. I'd love to maybe do a part two at one time because sure uh, we got so many more things to do. I yeah, know you're going to be going, you're going to be going back on tour. And, uh, collect yeah. a bunch of questions and we can uh, fire away. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go back out uh, with Mr. Big in uh, England and Europe, as I said earlier, and I uh, get done end of August. Right. That'll be around for the fall, which is nice because we sadly we lost our cat uh, uh, a while back. And uh, oh. we're, we're still utterly devastated over the lo his loss. We sure. love that cat. So we're going to try and find another kitty cat or maybe two uh, this fall to kind oh, of great. fill up that uh, hole in our house and our hearts and all. So, sure. uh, so well, because I'll be home, I have a chance to bond with him. So that'll be cool. Right. But, uh, and then, uh, I got a bunch of records that are lined up on my, my little to do sheet here, doing a bunch of tracks for people around already. We already got 20 tracks lined mm -hmm. up for the next two weeks. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> and, uh, yeah. I'm not sure who, uh, I had a couple possibilities of, of touring uh, next year. I can't talk about any of them yet, but, uh, 
I know right. I'll be out playing live as much as humanly possible. I, I say I right. play live. I play live to live, and I live to play live. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'll be doing more of that as well. But thank you for having me on, Anton. Yeah. And, uh, to your listeners and watchers, uh, yeah. base community is a, is a is a great community. We generally help each other out, and it's pretty cool. Uh, right. So uh, if I can be of any help to anyone, you can find me on social media easily. It's really me, blue check mark, certified, mm-hmm. verified, whatever. If I can help you with uh, answering a question or giving you some advice. I'm always happy to do it here in Nashville. I do some master classes. I'm going to start them up again after I'm done with this next part of the tour. You sit down with me for a, over an hour. We videotape the whole thing and we go over all kinds of yeah. things right, that I think you might find helpful. Sure. So uh, I'll be posting about that and uh, more to come. But again, thank you for having me on and my oh. best to you and all your watchers and listeners. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and, and Billy, do me a favor, stay on with me for a minute after we stop recording. Uh, <clears throat> got something else I wanted to ask you, uh, but sure thank thing. you to everybody for watching. This is living in the limelight podcast with Anton Scholl, my very special guest, Billy Sheehan. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we appreciate Billy, everything that you do for us. Thank you so much. Very kind of you. Thank uh, you. Good night. Thank you for joining our living in the limelight podcast with your host, Anton Scholl. Please feel free to comment, like, follow, share, and subscribe. And also add us to your playlist on your favorite streaming sites. Thanks again for joining and we'll talk to you again next week.